for the first half of this introduction to co-atoms, I'll be talking about um, laser cooling of atoms, right? So I'm an experimentalist and that's like, I operate slightly differently, right? And so laser cooling is quite cool. I like it a lot. So uh, let's go and see what's there to be learned. So now we know that the future is here, right? Like this, this whole cam is around, revolves around quantum computing and quantum computation. So we have all the fancy big names, big words coming out like, we must always mention Shaw's algorithm, right? Because that's what kick-started the whole like, revolution. Something, something, exponential speed up, and then everybody is hooked onto it, right? So um, in recent days, we've seen a lot more um, different terms being thrown out, like quantum supremacy, if you recall Google, IBM, and all this. And some people are even entering this foray of quantum machine learning. So it's quite nice because um, there are lots of promises that have been made, in a sense. Uh, because of all these theoretical developments. But there just exists kind of one small issue, and that is that um, we don't quite have a practically working, use, practically useful working quantum computer at the moment. And so it's kind of like, that, as was mentioned before, that there can be many physical platforms where you can implement computation. And so for example, you can have um, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, you can have quantum dots, you can have NV centers, the actual. I should use a laser pointer. So like you have NMR, quantum dots, MV centers, um, what photonic waveguides, uh, quantum optics, you even have superconducting circuits, which are the go-to for the industry industry players now. You have like Google, IBM, Microsoft, and all this uh, putting lots of money into this technology. You can have trapped ions and um, neutral atoms as well. So uh, trap ions are the other leaders in the, being the candidate to realize a proper, scalable, practically useful quantum computer. And so in no unbiased um, choice, we are going to look at a certain aspect of um, atomic systems right, that uh, has allowed them to develop to this degree. So this is essentially this whole idea of laser cooling of atoms that allow everything to happen. And some people might ask, oh, why, why would this be interesting? Why would these two systems uh, be meaningful to look at, right? I can, well, there are uh, many nice physical reasons. Uh, the same can be said for everything else, actually. But I mean, just like when I was a child, like you, you watch Discovery Channel, you see all the astrophysics photos, and you're like, ah, that's so beautiful, right? I mean, the same thing can be said for this sort of atomic tabletop experiment. It's just beautiful. Okay, these are all uh, experimental results, right, from different groups that exist all over the world. What you are seeing here are literally like individual atoms that are controlled to a degree that is like quite amazing. Um, you have all, both neutral and uh, trapped ions. Like here, we have our little bobby. That's my contribution. And, and so uh, it's just beautiful, right? And of course, there's also the other, as an experimentalist, there is the other beauty to it. And that is that you get to work with lasers on a daily basis. I right? get a pew pew all the time. And it's pretty cool. Not everybody can say that they, their job is to align lasers. Um, yeah, so you know what to do, right? We'll try and now go and understand what is it about laser cooling, right? Um, I'll walk you through as much as I can because there are some very beautiful physics involved as well. So to begin, we have to first start by understanding atomic structure, right? What makes up an atom or how does it behave in a way? So you might have recalled this kind of um, device from your physics lab in school, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. What this is is just a gas filled with it's a glass tube filled with gas of some element and then it's connected to some high voltage supply what you do is you run high voltage current through the gas and after some time you'll notice that they start to glow and if you plug in different elements you will see different colors so you can then say oh i wonder what is in those light right that, that is given off so to figure out what is actually coming out from the, the emission of this gas uh, we can consider taking the light passing it through a diffraction grating, right, which has this property of splitting light according to its wavelength. Or you can use a prism as well, uh, whichever works for you. And then um, if you're an experimentalist, you look at this and go like, hmm, let's clean this up as much as we can, like consider putting a collimate, collimation split to clean up the excess light and then block off background and whatnot, put this on a nice device. And then that would result in giving, showing you these lines. So these are called the spectral lines of the element. These are like the fingerprints. Because for each element, these lines are unique. They are a result of the different potential that electrons see due to the well, different masses, different uh, proton charge, different electron number as well. 
So here you have sodium, neon, and krypton plus, for example. Now, this behavior of atoms, or this gas emission, was known uh, early on in the 19th century, but it wasn't until the 20th century where an origin, or an explanation for why you see discrete lines, right, was given. So that is uh, due to the so-called Nell, uh, the guy Nell, 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 Nell's ball, <laughs> or the ball model of the atom. So uh, basically the idea is that you have um, electrons orbiting about some central positively charged nucleus, and the electrons are only allowed certain distances from the nucleus. It cannot be anywhere else in between. Right? So because, um, because of this uh, discrete set of uh, distances, you end up having discrete uh, so-called orbits. And these orbits are known as stationary states. When the electrons are there, they don't run away from this state. Okay, something must be done for it to change right, to another state. So these stationary states also correspond to some energy level. And each, um, each state has an energy, associated energy. And when, um, when the electron, say, goes down from 3 to 2, the energy difference between these states is released in the form of photons. Okay, and then the photon itself would have a, the, that energy. And then you can, of course, I'll write it as this HF or H bar omega. So you'll see this later in more detail, aside in more detail. And so um, this model explains quite nicely why we see discrete lines instead of a continuous spectrum. And however, it doesn't work that well for multi electron atoms. So it works well only for hydrogen and hydrogen-like ones, but that's good enough for us. Okay, so we can also consider the reverse case, right? Like, what if we take a photon with energy that is exactly equal to the energy difference between the levels? Now, then this is where we can excite the electron from two to three, right? And in this case, is uh, what we call resonance. So we can then further ask another question: What happens if we are not exactly on resonance? Like, what if it's just a little bit off? So we know that in nature that you don't really have infinities, you don't have like vertical lines. So we don't expect that just by being a bit off, you would have a complete shut off, right? It, you know. So the way to describe this behavior, uh, this characteristic, is by considering the probability of absorbing a photon versus the frequency. So this, if we if it's absorbed, you know that the electron had transition, right? So depending on the frequency of the photon. How far it is away from the resonance frequency, which is why I call here a detuning delta. And that uh, it can be expressed in this manner. This, this form here is known as a Lorentzian. And if I plot down here for you several of this uh, Lorentzian with this gamma that is different. So gamma is known as the line width of the transition. Right? So you see, if resonance is here, and if I'm off by a little bit, so I, by this value delta, for different line widths, you would see that the probability to absorb the photon is different. Essentially, the larger the line width, the greater the spread of frequency that would still give you a considerable probability to absorb the photon. Okay, so this is about just the levels that are involved here. So this, this is sufficient enough. Um, so far, right, uh, just going through this bit is sufficient for us to understand the atomic side. So, uh, if we move on, hello, hold on. Yeah, so then next we need to look a little bit at light, right? So we know light is an electromagnetic wave. I think, I, I'm not sure, like you would hear this line maybe many, many times <laughs> throughout the entire camp. Um, from the Maxwell's equation, you, would, you can obtain this wave equation and then you have a, you can get a solution to this wave equation. You can write it down like that. So it's an arbitrary one. And if I plot it out, it looks like this, okay? So cosine, right? And I intentionally do not label the x axis. Right. So if it is a spatial unit, then the peak to peak will be uh, telling you, describing to you the wavelength. And then you can define this wave number, which is like the uh, well, two pi over lambda here. So this is like the spatial frequency in a way. And if, if the x axis is the time unit, then you get the period between the peak to peak, or which is uh, you have one over f is equal to one over f. So you can get a frequency and then you can write down an angular frequency of two pi f. And of course you can have a phase offset phi to tell you when to actually start the cosine, what's the offset. And so that's a very general uh, description of a solution to the wave equation. And here we would uh, have a little plot of how the electromagnetic wave looks like. You have the electric field and the magnetic field, both oscillating uh, in sync. And this is what light is, right? just a series of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. Now, 
for us to understand laser cooling, we have to look at the other aspect of light, like, which is the particle nature. And so this is very clearly demonstrated uh, when one looks at the photoelectric effect. Uh, if you are not familiar with this, you can ask questions later on. But the main point here is that light can also as well behave like billiard balls. Literally, it can impart momentum. So it carries momentum, h over lambda, or h bar k, so wave number here again k. Uh, h is Planck's constant, of course. And it also has energy. And then the energy here we write as hs. So this s is literally the frequency of the electric field oscillation. And just another fact to remark is that the intensity in the light of a beam of light, okay, is just can express can be expressed as just counting the number of photons and and each of them carrying uh, or having energy h bar omega, and then per unit time and per unit area. So uh, how to make a beam more intense is either you send more photons in, or you send it in a shorter pulse, or you squeeze it down to a small area. Okay, so that's like kind of what intensity is like for when you consider the particle side. And so yes. Particle nature is important. Okay, so then the next question that naturally arises is ah, so how is it that light interacts with an atom, right? Why should it be that you shine light? You know, the atom wants to react to that. Some might say you can call it magic, some might say you write down the dipole interaction term. Um, whatever it is, for us, the exact details don't really matter so much. It suffice to say um, that the atom can absorb a photon and can emit the photon. And why should it be the case is you can imagine that the atom is made up of positively charged nucleus, negatively charged electron. So these are charged particles, which can be influenced by an electric field, which is what light is. Right? So if you think of it this way, then it doesn't come as a surprise that light can interact with an atom. Okay. So the exact details, exact nature of the interaction, which is very interesting, is not so important for us now. Now what we do next, of course, is we further simplify things. In this case, we treat the atom as a two-level system, which is a gross oversimplification, but surprisingly works very well. Actually, in a lot of cases, it works very well. So you can consider the ground state to be something like, oh, the electron being at the nearest position to the nucleus, the excited state being the electron slightly further away. And there's only these two positions that you can take. So if we send the photon in, um, an electron in the ground state can uh, be excited to the excited state. So the atom can transition to the excited state. Right? The picture you have would be like, oh, the electron jumps. So if that is on resonance, and if the electron is already in an excited state, or similarly, if the atom is in an excited state, and we send the photon in, we can stimulate an emission. Right? We can bring out the photon. And by doing so, we can uh, have a nice way to describe the state of this atom well, with this block sphere. We are not going to use a block sphere, it's just nice to have it here. It might come in later on in the second half. Um, so what is interesting is that if we consider driving this system continuously with a coherent source of light, and then you look at the probability to find the atom in the ground or the excited state. So in this case, blue is the ground. We start off with the atom in the ground state, right? Now, as you continually drive it, you see that the probability to find the atom in the excited state and ground state would oscillate coherently. So this oscillation is known as a rubby flop or rubby flopping. And the rate on, at which this flop occurs is known as the Rabi frequency omega. So this Rabi frequency is proportional to the square root of the intensity. Makes sense if you think about it. The more intense uh, the light that you send in, the faster this flop should occur. Right? It just makes it go up and down faster. And so what is of interest is that there's this point that exists where the probability to find the atom in the ground state is completely zero, and it, and it would have unique probability to be in the excited state. So it's called a pi time. This will be maybe elaborated on later further. But for now, um, you just note that this does not take into account um, simulated emission. So some of you would know that if the electron is in some excited state, after some time, it should decay spontaneously, right? Oh, sorry, it doesn't take into account spontaneous emission, I'm gonna say. So if you want to take it into account, um, we have to do some serious work, which I omit the details here, obviously. Um, so spontaneous emission is when the electron is in an excited state, after some time, known as the lifetime, it has a high chance of decaying down and emitting a photon spontaneously, or just randomly. So if you take this into account and go back to the scenario where we are driving this coherently, continuously, at some point we expect that the, the steady excited state probability, so the probability to find the electron or the atom in the excited state, 
would be some value that is non-zero, neither is it unity. So it, express, it can be expressed like this. So here we have, again, the rubbish frequency omega. We have detuning delta. So this is detuning from resonance. And uh, one thing we can try and look at now is we can consider what happens to this probability as omega goes to infinity, right? So for those who are quick, you can see that, oh, infinity, infinity, everywhere else except these two terms means that you get something at like half. Okay, so it's a very interesting uh, outcome that the excited state, the steady excited state probability to find the atom in excited state is half. Okay. Now, so this is a useful result we'll come back to later. And okay, we can go on then to the look at the scattering force on an atom. Right? So we know that force, according to Newton, uh, is nothing more than the change of momentum, so the time derivative of E. And we can consider a scenario here. Oh, there is, let's say there's an atom at rest. We send a resonant photon of, well, just one photon in. The atom absorbs the photon, and at the same time, um, the photon imparts a kick, right? So there is a change in momentum now. And then after some time, it spontaneously decays um, a photon out in the same direction. You see that, oh, the net change of the momentum on, of the atom is zero. So we might be tempted to say, oh, that it does nothing, right? But that's not quite true because if we consider repeated events of scattering, of absorbing and emitting, the absorption of photon always comes from the same direction, whereas the emission, it, because it is random, it has the equal chance to emit the photon in anywhere in the four pi solid angle. So what this means is that on average, over a large number, the photons that are emitted right, would cancel each other's momentum kicks out. So on the emission side, there is no contribution to, uh, there's no force whatsoever, because they all cancel out. But from the incoming side, there is always a momentum kick. So therefore, there is a non-zero force. And this is known as the scattering force, because the more you scatter, the more you know, the, the, the larger the force. So we can try and calculate or figure out what this scattering force might be. So we know that, oh, the more you scatter, the, the, more the, the larger the force will be. And then for each photon, you have a certain momentum hit bar k. The scattering rate here now is a product of the line width and the excited state, steady excited state probability to find the atom in the excited state. So why is it the excited state that matters? It's because you only get the kick when it decays. Right? You, if you, everything is in the excited state, then you cannot really get the kick after that. So we can plug this thing together and say, oh, if you consider steady state, there is resonant, and so on and so forth, we get this expression here, which gives us a certain max force. Now, why is it max? Uh, that's because no matter how much you drive, you increase your intensity to, to drive the, the transition further and further, this would cause the, this key value to saturate to half. So there will always be a max force that you can get. This is given by this hit part k gamma over two. Okay? So now that we have the force, we can then ask the question, how strong is it? Right? So you know, let's calculate some sort of acceleration. That's something that's easy to relate to. So F equals MA, you just rewrite F over M. We plug in these terms. You can also re-express this in terms of the recoil velocity on the that the atom feels. It'll be this B over two tau tau here is the lifetime of the excited state. And you can plug in some numbers. So if you consider sodium with its 589 nanometer transition, you have this 23U, one U is whatever, and gamma is roughly 10 megahertz. If you plug these numbers in, you get staggering numbers, right? You see acceleration is 10 orders and five orders of magnitude greater than the acceleration on Earth. That is fast. That is strong. I think it's fast. And if you calculate the recoil velocity, it's a really cute thing, it's a 3 cm per second. So the, the atom is being recoiled at 3 cm per second velocity. Yeah. So this is um well, I got lost here. Yeah, okay, so. This is some numbers that you can get from this calculation, right? So now uh, we can go one step further and assume that, oh, what if we are able to have apply this acceleration uh, and apply it constantly? Then we can think that, aha, we learned kinematics is applicable when you have constant acceleration. So you pick out this form, right? And then you figure, hey, maybe if we assume that our acceleration is something like half of the maximum, then we can ask ourselves, at what distance does it stop, right? So you just plug the V here to zero. You get this stopping distance. Okay, fair enough. So let's get more numbers, right? <laughs> so if you assume that you heat up a bar of uh, sodium, let's say, 
and then you have the vapor that comes out. So the most probable velocity for the sodium atoms would be something like uh, 1,000 meters per second. That's an easy number to calculate, right? This puts the stopping distance around at around 1.1 meters. So now if you think about this distance, right, 1.1 meter is very manageable for a, an individual human being, right? Why do I say it this way? Because consider the extreme experiments, like you know, if you know the linear accelerators or CERN, they're just mind-bogglingly like huge and large, right? So to be able to manipulate these things on this length scale, it's quite nice. It allow, this is the reason why lots of um, well, the AMO field can, could have flourished in this manner because these tabletop experiments are manageable. Right? It's literally a, a thing about being able to do the experiment. And so because we started with something like a thousand meter per second and then we ended up with zero velocity, we decelerated the atom, we stopped it. So essentially that means that we cooled it down, right? So this is what it means. Uh, this is how we do laser cooling. We just keep shining photons and keep smacking the atom, just keep pinging it until it slows down and stops. So we take away ener kinetic energy from the atom and, then we, and that's why we say we cool it down using lasers. Okay? So this is laser cooling. But there's more to the story, of course, and there's a lot more actually. Um, we can always take, take it one step further, right? So the, next, uh, the, the thing is that we have to consider other effects. So the, maybe a surprising thing to consider here is um, the Doppler effect. So we might be very familiar with the Doppler effect for those of you who frequently go to the park connectors and then people are riding bicycles or on their e-scooters and they're blasting out music and they're going past you and, you go, and then you listen to the song and they listen to it go terribly out of tune. And that's the Doppler effect that you just witnessed, right? That when there's a source of frequency and there's some relative motion between the source and an observer, there will be a perceived change in the frequency, right? So the frequency that is observed will be different from the source depending on this relative velocity. And so the main point here is that as long as there's some non-zero relative velocity delta v, you will always have some frequency shift. Right? And then this applies not just to sound waves, but it's an in general a wave phenomenon. So all waves, including light waves, like electromagnetic waves, will be susceptible to this as well, or are affected by this. So if you consider a scenario where you have a source of light, like for you, if you have no relative velocity, you would see something like green. To so somebody who is watching the source go away, the light will appear slightly more red, or as you say, red shifted. For the guy who is watching it approach it, it will be blue shifted. So uh, it's good to remember that when there's uh, relative motion, you get this red shifting and blue shifting. Um, incidentally, this is also how uh, astronomers figure out whether stars are receding or approaching us, and that's how they figure out that the entire universe is actually expanding. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you remember earlier, I said fingerprints of elements and so you get spectrum, and then now if you see that they are shifting around, you can deduce a lot of information basically. So if we are not the atom, right, looking at some light source, what happens, right? We know that uh, okay, you can consider some lab frame where you see both the, the atom and the light that is moving. Then you can transform yourself to be with the atom. So you're sitting on the atom space. And then you don't see any velocity on the atom, but what happens is that you see the frequency of the photon is shifted away to some other value, right? You know, it's kV. And then that should already pose a significant thought to you, right? Like, oh, we started with some velocity, but then the moment we slow down, we are seeing a different frequency. So that means we are out of resonance, which means the scattering force vanishes. And that's indeed the problem. So basically what that means is that the moment you shine the, the laser onto the atom, they feel the force, and then they don't feel it anymore. Okay, so as quickly as you, you apply the strong force, it would, I mean the large magnitude, it will very quickly vanish. So that's the problem. Like you, you cannot work if it's out of resonance. So then of course the next question is how can you maintain resonance? Right? Um, a very straightforward approach to this would be to say mm, maybe we use differing colors, right? So we change the frequency as you are shining it. So that's Kind of like my first when I first learned of this problem, that was my first response as well. Like you just change the color, right? Like what, what's the problem? So this is known as chuck cooling. And to me, it feels like a very brute force approach to solving this problem. Like you just change the laser frequency. Technically not so easy, but it's, it's been done. Now, um the, so one of the reasons why I love this topic so much is because there exists this other very elegant solution to this problem. Like when I first heard it, I was mind blown. Okay? So instead of changing the laser, you can change the atom, okay? And they'll be like, ah, why, you, why when you change the atom, right? So 
um, to change the atom's energy level. So if you recall, the energy levels were something that I just gave you. I told you that it came from the potential that the electrons see. Now, we can do other things to manipulate these energy levels as well. We can apply electric field, magnetic fields, and so on and so forth. And so um, for the case where you apply a magnetic field, there is an energy shift and it's known as the Zeeman effect. So well, in a nutshell, the main point here would be that this energy levels would shift uh, proportionately to the strength of the magnetic field that you apply. Okay. So what that does is that rewrite that changes your resonance conditions, right? Originally, without this D field term, this is whatever that is got given, and then this is what you have, right? So now with this term they include, if you make it uh, depend on spatially dependent, then you might be able to always maintain resonance condition, right? All you have to do is to figure out how does this G change in space as well? And then, okay, that's something that we can do, right? Because we know kinematics. We can again, using those equations from earlier, we express the velocity of the atom as a function of distance, as a function of displacement. And then plugging these two together, we can solve it to obtain the magnetic field profile. All right, so this magnetic field profile would satisfy the resonance condition all the time, right? So what that, how does it look like? So if you see here, we have, if we apply such a magnetic field um, along the travel of, say, some atoms that are coming out. So to, to get this decaying magnetic field, the way we would do it in the lab is to have um, a series of um, electromagnets where you just wind the coils. So you see here that the coil becomes uh, thinner and thinner because you want the B field to decrease. And so let's say you heat up sodium in, in, in some oven. 900 Kelvin, and then they all spew out with a thousand meter per second. So the moment it enters this um, region, it locks in place to become resonant, right? So then as it is traveling, it experiences the deceleration. So its velocity goes down, which means that the Doppler shift on the light changes, but that Doppler shift is compensated for by the decrease in the magnetic field. So at all times, it would be feeling the same constant deceleration. And so it would slow down basically close to the zero velocity that we had planned for. Now, what about the cases where, oh, the slow, there are, so because you have a gas, they don't all have the same velocity. So what about those who are slow? Well, the slow ones don't matter, right? Because although this segment here takes care of the fast ones, at some point, the velocity of the slow ones will be equal to, I mean, will be the one that matches the resonance condition, and then they will just get clumped along. So this, it's known as a Zeeman slow, and it's like one of the very early, I, I thought it was such an elegant solution to the problem, right? How do you maintain that? This works all the time, right? so beautiful. So, um, yeah, I, I absolutely like, wow, love it. Okay, so, so these Zeeman slows are nice, right? Um, but if you, you know, think even further ahead, right? You can imagine this scenario where what you're really doing is just sending photons along one axis and they're scattering light everywhere else, right? So you, you may be able to solve like, slow it down along one axis, but in the transverse direction, so in the plane that is perpendicular, the velocity is still quite high, right? In the sense that the atoms are still not cool because you don't have anything there. So what can you do to fix this? You know, the straightforward answer is you plug in more beams, right? <laughs> you just um, put more laser beams, okay? And so there's this nice way of setting up um, such beams. So when you have, uh, for each of the orthogonal directions, the three of them, you place a pair of counter-propagating beams, right? And then you choose them to be such that they are slightly rate detuned or detuned lower in frequency to resonance. So if you have um, stationary atom, well, what does it see, right? It sees that from both the left and right beam, they, they, are, they look equal. So the probability to scatter photons are equal, which means that the scattering force from both sides cancels out, right? So it would not feel anything. Now, if you were in the other case where there is some velocity, some non-zero velocity to the right, let's say. So what happens is that Doppler shift will push the beam on the right closer to resonance than the beam on the left. So it pushes the, the one on the left further away. What this means is that you have a preferential um, scattering of photons from the beam on the right, correct? And so the way this is set up is such that your beam that opposes the motion would always have a better chance of scattering photons or basically applying a force. And because you have this for all three directions, you essentially have a, a, a three-dimensional frictional force, right? And it's also called the optical molasses technique. 
because um, the atom is as it's thought as though the atom is experiencing some like viscous force, like basically frictional force, where its motion is always opposed. So like oh, this is quite quite cool, quite nice, right? You can slow them down. Then one might think, oh, does this mean you know we can cool it down to absolute zero? Because um, it seems like there are no reasons why we cannot keep cooling it down further, right? Um, but we all know that from the second law, uh, third law of thermodynamics, that you cannot approach, you cannot get to zero, okay? It's just not possible. So nope. Then we can ask, uh, but why? I cannot, it's not obvious why that sh why there should be a limit, right? Um, so um, there is this, this limit is known as the Doppler cooling unit. And, and by the way, um, I forgot to mention, Doppler cooling because you make use of the Doppler effect to cool down the atoms. So this is Doppler cooling limit. I write it out as such. There's KDT equals to H bar gamma over two. So like H bar is like hmm? line width. Why is the line width important? Why is it limit the temperature that you can achieve? Uh, so the physical reason behind this is because if you consider the scenario where uh -huh, the velocity is large, right? What this does is that you can clearly distinguish between both beams, right? You can get your preferential scattering. Okay. Um, however, when your velocity is small, as it gets slower and slower, your V gets smaller and smaller. What happens is that they start to the Doppler shift starts to decrease, and at some point they enter the line width of the transition. And now well, I say enter the line width, but the line width of the transition becomes important because they now both have would appear to look as though they have equal probability of scattering photons. So you lose the preferential part here now. Like if you are equally likely to scatter from both beams, then you no longer have a, fric a frictional force. You no longer necessarily oppose the motion. Okay. So in this case, the Doppler limit for sodium is something on the order of um, 240 microkelvin. That's very cold already, but you can still go lower. And this translates to a probable velocity of like half a meter per second, right? And that's quite nice, but we know that um, we cannot approach, we cannot get zero velocity, right? So um, what happens if you have something that's non-zero? You know that given enough time, your atoms will all run away. Right? You just drift out. So what can you do if you want to keep them there or to work with them? Right? You would have to use a trap, right? So you want them cold, but you also want them to remain at the same place. And so this um, trapping ideas would be the topic of the next section. And so before I say I am done, I just like to say, are there any questions? Now it's a good time to ask. Because my time is up. Well, OK. We have one question in the chat. How can I see the chat? Does the Doppler limit come from the uncertainty principle? Does the Doppler limit come from the uncertainty principle? In a way, yes. Um, because the uncertainty principle is also intrinsically or very closely related to the line width of the transition. Um, so the, the, <laughs> the, the, so the, the question really is more a matter. I mean, to, to me, I translate or I understand this question to mean that um, why should there be line width in transitions in the first place? Because, um, I mean, some people will know now that the, one of the way of explaining why there is a line width is because there is an uncertainty principle, right? Data E, data T. So, um, yes, you can say it that way. Um, but I think if I try to answer it in, in, in the really proper, proper, rigorous way, it would be like one textbook maybe. <laughs> so my short answer would be yes. Um, yeah, if, if you're interested to learn more, I can discuss later on as well. Okay, thank you, Jaron. So if there are no further questions, I'll pass the time to Mo Yong. Stop sharing. What is the application of this laser cooling? Like, what is the use of it? Ah, so uh, maybe before I pass the time. So um, earlier when I showed you the beautiful pictures of all the experiments, right? Those were at temperatures, those, those were atoms at even colder temperatures than the Doppler limit. They were at like hundreds of nano Kelvin. So um, the problem is that in order to reach those kind of temperatures, we would have, we, we can't just, that there, there does not exist a singular method to one shot drop from some high temperature all the way down to nano Kelvin. So um, a lot of times the way cooling works is that you do it in steps, sorry, in steps. So, so you, do, you do it in one stage and another stage and another stage. 
and laser cooling has this um, use. Basically, um, you, you need laser cooling to obtain the low temperature. That's one point. The second point is that um, when you cool the system down, you are sort of removing entropy, right? And basically, that means that you can arrange things nicely. And so there are some proposals that have been put forth about um, like if you arrange the atoms in some array, some lattice, and then you laser cool it down, you are essentially initializing a system. You start from the same state all the time. So in a sense, laser cooling has an application in um, quantum computation. Uh, cool. That answers the question. Okay, nice. Okay, hello. So I'm um, Muyang. Um, if there's construction noise, I'm sorry, my David is uh, deciding to do some drilling today. So um, I'm a PhD student in the same lab as Darren, and today I'll be presenting on the second part of the lecture on the introduction to code atoms and the topic of trapping and manipulation of atoms. So one of you asked just now, um, you have cool atoms, what do you want to actually do with them? And of course, we want to do experiments with them. Um, one of the more popular uh, users of code atoms is, of course, quantum computing. But if code atoms can only be used for quantum computing, they'll be pretty boring. So we have other cool things that we can do with it as well. So for example, you might know that a solid is determined, it's basically defined that if you are an atom in a solid, if you move from one position to another, you see the same, all the same atoms around you. So you can't tell the difference between one point in space and another point in space. This is what's known as discrete uh, translational symmetry. So if you move from one point to another point, you see the same thing. And it turns out um, you can do the same thing in time. You can get discrete time crystals where you can move discrete steps in time and get back the same thing again. Uh, this was um, first experimentally verified in a trapped ion system, uh, which it, the infographic is shown here. And other cool things you can do with cool atoms is things like this. Um, this is a video from one of the more interesting talks that I've attended uh, on something called quantum fireworks. So this is these are trapped atoms at the center of some trap, and you can see that as they play around with the magnetic field, the atoms actually blow up in a showcase of what they call quantum fireworks. But the problem is that to do all these experiments, cooling using Doppler cooling is not enough, and the reason is twofold. The first is that the atoms have non-zero speed. And so, the, uh, as Jeremy mentioned, the atoms will still ev eventually move out of your interaction zone. So maybe your laser field or your magnetic field will still move out of it. And so you can't do experiments anymore. The second shortcoming is in terms of manipulation. So it's, so far, we still haven't discussed how we actually interact with atoms to perform such experiments. So in this presentation, I'm going to be going over two things. The first are the traps. Um, I'm going to be discussing two types of traps, the ion trap and the magnetic optical trap. And second, the second part of the presentation will be on atoms, where I discuss atomic structures in, in detail and go through some of the possible transitions that you can drive in atoms. So first of all, traps. So trapping atoms, um, as you've learned from the previous part, that Doppler cooling is not as simple as it seems. And trapping atoms is similar. It's not, as, um, it's not very easy. So let's try to start off with something easier and trap rocks instead. So what do I mean by trap? So the layman's definition of trap in this case would be to control an object such that it cannot easily move away from its intended position. So I want to be able to put an object somewhere and I want it to stay there um, if the, if, even if minor forces act on it. And in the case of rocks, Mother Nature actually solved the problem millennia ago in the form of valleys. So you can imagine a rock at the top of a plateau as shown here, and we control it uh, by rolling it down the hill to the bottom, to play, put it at the bottom of the valley. And if one of your friends comes around and try to push it out of this valley where you want it to be, well, as long as the force is small enough, the boulder will just roll around at the bottom and return to the bottom of the valley eventually. So this, by definition, is a trapped rock. But why does this work in the first place? And that answer has, of course, to do with gravity, and specifically gravitational potential. So if you plot the graph of position against the potential, of course, your gravitational potential is given by a simple mgh, then you get a potential graph that looks like this. This is what we call a potential well, because it looks like a well. There's a tip at the bottom. 
And what happens to the wrong is that it simply happily stays at the bottom of the potential because it has the lowest energy there. And if you try to knock this rock about and it starts oscillating, it will eventually return back down to the bottom of the trap simply because of something called the principle of minimum energy, which states that the system will always tend to a state of its lowest energy, or in this case, of the lowest potential. Now, the, in general, the optimal potential, well, the shape of the optimal potential well that we want to use to trap rocks as well as atoms is known as a harmonic well, three-dimensional harmonic well. So in this case, I plot, uh, this is a plot of the harmonic law in the x and y dimensions. The height is the potential itself. And this three-dimensional harmonic well is a linear combination of three one-dimensional harmonic wells. And a harmonic well basically looks something like this. It's an x squared curve. Um, that's all there is. And this forms the well. And if you put a particle at the bottom, it will happily just stay there. And that's what we want. So, but the problem with using gravity to trap atoms is that gravity is very weak and atoms have a very small mass. So it feels very smooth, very little of the potential, uh, gravitational potential. So we tend to use two other potentials instead. One is the electric potential, which are basically voltages. And these are used in ion traps, which are used to trap any kind of charged particles. And there's magnetic potentials generated by magnetic coils, uh, which are used to trap atoms and molecules. So we'll be discussing the ion trap first. And to discuss the ion trap, we have to discuss the electric potentials. And to discuss the electric potentials, we have to refer back to what uh, Jerry mentioned just now on the topic of Maxwell's equations. So Maxwell's equations govern all of electricity and magnetism. And it's a set of four equations that you can see here. Uh, we're not going to be discussing them in detail, except for just one of them, this equation, which says that the upside down, tri the upside down triangle with productive with the electric field must equal to zero. Now you can rewrite this in another way, saying that the proper triangle, the upright triangle multiplied by the capital psi equals to zero, where the capital psi is the electric potential. Now all these upside down triangles and upright triangles are simplifications because people are lazy to write differential equations. Uh, specifically, if you write out this upright triangle, it looks something like this. It says that the second differential of your electric potential with respect to x plus the second differential of your electric potential with respect to y and with respect to z. And if you sum everything together, it must equal to zero. So this is a rule that all electric potentials, all, all voltages must follow. So with this in mind, let's try to form an ion trap. And uh, let's try it with the easier case. Let's only use static potentials. So non-time dependent potentials. In this case, because we want a three-dimensional harmonic well, the electric potential can be written as an amplitude term, the U, as well as a combination of three harmonic wells, each of yeah, which each follows the following the form of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And alpha, beta, and gamma are the relative strengths between the three harmonic wells. Now, if you use Maxwell's equations on this potential, and this will be your exercise one in your notes, you get a simple constraint on alpha, beta, and gamma. And the constraint is simply alpha plus beta plus gamma must equal to zero. Now this is this looks simple, but it has a very big consequence in the sense that alpha and beta and gamma are the relative strengths between the harmonic potentials in the three dimensions. And for three of these numbers to sum to zero, at least one of them must be negative. Now what's the problem with that? So as I mentioned just now, the one-dimensional harmonic well is a graph that looks like this. It has a positive x squared graph. And you can imagine that if one of them is a, has a negative factor in front, this entire thing flips. So it goes from a well to being a hill. So, it be, uh, so with this constraint, we will always have anti-trapping along one axis. So if you decide to uh, try to plot this out, it looks something like this. Along the x-axis over here, is a, the harmonic trapping potential. And along the y-axis, it's the anti-trapping potential. So how do we actually trap ions, given that this is a problem? And people came up with smart solutions, specifically using time-dependent uh, voltages. So what they, what they imagined was saying that, let's say at time equals to zero, you have this uh, potential that, you sh that I showed just now. It is, it is trapping along the x-axis and anti-trapping along the y-axis. And let's say I try to rotate it about the center point over here so that after a pi time, it becomes something like this. It has an anti-trapping potential along the x-axis and a trapping potential along the y-axis. 
And if you decide to rotate this thing fast enough, then the effective potential that the ion feels at the center of the trap is something like this. It's an effective three-dimensional harmonica. And this is exactly what they use to trap ions and ion trap. It's a combination of static and time-dependent voltages. So what I've discussed so far is specific to a specific class of ion traps known as a linear pore ion trap. Uh, it consists of four rods. Two of them has the static voltages, the proper ones. Two of them is the AC voltages, the uh, blue ones. And along the, this radial axis, uh, which is defined as a z-axis, we have a DC potential as well. So if you draw the electric potential, uh, the potential along in, in this trap, it looks something like this. It is harmonic traps all along this z direction. And you can just happily put ions there and they will stay there for almost as long as you wish. And if you, you can actually take pictures of this, and this is a picture we took in our, our lab. So this is a, uh, two trapped ions along one of, in one of these ion traps. And all these bright dots are the trapped ions along this radio axis. Now on the other hand, the other class of traps is known as the magnetic optical trap. And as the name suggests, it is a combination of a magnetic field as well as optics in the form of lasers that form a trap. Now to understand the magnetic optical trap or MOP for short, uh, we first have to um, understand why atoms and magnets will interact in the first place. So you know for, uh, for ions, it's relatively simple. Because ions have charge, it will interact with voltages and electric fields. But why would magnets interact with atoms? And the uh, reason for this has to do with spin. Uh, all we have to know for this is that it's a fundamental property, uh, both electrons and the nucleus has it, that is associated with the magnetic field. How is it exactly associated? So if you draw a plot of the energy with respect to the magnetic field, when the magnetic field is at zero, you have this kind of a structure. So this is the S and P shells that you have learned for chemistry. So S is the circular shell, P is the dumbbell shell along the X, Y, and Z axis. And when the magnetic field is zero, the energy levels of the subshells of the P shell, so PX, PY, and PZ, they are degenerate. They have the same energy. But if the magnetic field is larger than zero, these subshells break apart, so they have different energies. So in this case, Px has a lower energy and Pz has a higher energy than the center one. And if the magnetic field is smaller than zero, then the entire thing flips around. The other thing we have to consider for a mod is photon polarization, which you probably heard of before. So again, in the no magnetic field case, we can drive, we, we, are, we are interested in two transitions. The first is the transition from the ground state to the Px state over here which is done by a frequency omega naught and a photon polarization sigma minus, which is a photon uh, traveling in the anti clockwise direction. We can also do this to the right state by uh, having the same frequency because these guys have all have the same energy with a different polarization sigma plus. And you can imagine that when the magnetic field is non-zero, um, the energy splits as I've shown you just now, and the polarization, the polarization required to drive this transition remains the same is the sigma minus, but the frequency shifts by an omega naught minus delta. And similarly to the right, it becomes an omega naught plus delta for the resonance condition. This is very similar to the Zeeman's law that uh, Jerry mentioned just now, but in a slightly different way, because in the mod, the magnetic field is not a simple linear gradient. So this is what a mod typically looks like. There are two magnetic coils uh, on the top and the bottom, and you have uh, light beams coming in from the x and y axis. So there's four beams going here and from the top and the bottom as well. Now these magnetic coils are sit, uh, positioned in a way such that at the very center of the trap where you want the atoms to be, there is no magnetic field. But anywhere off of the center, you, the atoms will experience a magnetic field. So let's put this all together. How does, it, how does the model work? Well, it's very similar to the optical molasses actually. So along the, at the very center of the trap, the magnetic field is zero. So the energy split, there's, uh, these three guys are degenerate. They uh, have the same energy. And what we do is introduce two light fields. One is sigma minus polarized and one is sigma plus polarized. But the, um, different from just now is, the, uh, is that these photons are now red DQ. So they don't have enough energy to drive the transition from this guy to I, this guy or this guy. But if you are anywhere off of the center of the trap, your energy levels are split. So to the left, where the magnetic field is negative, you split in a downward way. To the right, where the magnetic field is positive, it splits in an upward way. 
And they all experience the same light field because the light is addressing all the atoms. And so they both have this kind of things. And you can notice that to the left, you can drive this transition because now it's resonant because of the frequency shift. And to the left, uh, to the right, you can drive this transition because uh, this is resonant. And you can imagine that now you have an atom in the set, uh, to the left of the trap and it feels a photon pushing it to the center because it absorbs this photon. And to the right of the trap, the photon will push it to the left because it absorbs this photon. And so effectively, it feels a restoring force whenever you're off center to push it back towards the center of the trap. And this forms an effective harmonic well across this uh, trap, uh, this magnetic trap, and that allows you to trap atoms. Now this, uh, so as you might have noticed, a lot of the concepts here are similar to the optical molasses. And in fact, if you actually write down the equation for the force on the atom, it is actually a combination of your optical molasses term. So your alpha times beta, uh, alpha times velocity, but it has an additional slowing term with a beta times B, which is where B is the magnetic field. So it, is a, uh, it, it provides additional confinement, which allows for actual effective trapping of atoms. So here is a video of a mod. Unfortunately, we couldn't find the source, but it looks very nice. So the special thing about the mod is that you can actually see the atoms with your bare eyes. You don't actually need a camera like the ion trap. So this white thing in the center that you see here, they're all trapped atoms. And what they are doing in this video is that they are playing around with the magnetic field. They are playing around with the polarization of the light. They are playing around with the intensity of the light as well as the shape of the light. And you can get this kind of very interesting effect um, just by trapping the atoms. And if you suddenly turn off the magnetic field, then of course everything di uh, diverses and everything just blows up. Um, this is not exactly the quantum fireworks that I showed you just now, but the, the idea is quite similar. So we've discussed traps. So we've managed to trap atoms. Um, how do we actually work with them? So in the previous part, uh, Jaron mentioned your two-level structure and how your ball model and things like that. But atoms are actually slightly more complicated than that. Um, and to, and the more the at the base of all this atomic physics is this simple idea. To perform experiments at atoms, we need to be able to move the, the valence electron of the atom between different excited states of the atom. So this is very similar to the idea in chemistry where your valence electron determines the chemical interactions that your molecule or your atom can have. In atomic physics, it's the same idea. It's the valence electrons that determines the physics in, um, in most scenarios, but we are not transferring the valence electron between atoms or sharing the valence electrons between atoms in the form of covalent bonds, but we have a single atom and we want to move it between different states of the same atom. So how do these states actually look like? So we are going to be taking the example of ethereum 171, which is what we use in our lab. And all these atoms that we work with in atomic physics are given this kind of a diagram. Uh, this is called a level diagram, and it's very, very important in doing atomic physics. It's very important in two ways. The first is that it shows all the possible excited levels that you can make your electron go to. So this basically tells you what kind of experiments you can do with this uh, atomic species. And it also tells you the allowed transitions between levels. So which state can go to which state. So because this is very fundamental, we're going to be going through the details step by step. So first of all, are atomic states. So all these horizontal lines that you see over here, um, the black lines, they are atomic states. You can take them to be valid solutions to the Schrodinger's equation for this specific atom. These are the states where the valence electron can go to. The second component are the term symbols. So you can, if you, you should have noticed that all these black lines, the states are grouped in specific uh, orders. So for example, you know, these four states are associated to the 2s half term, these four states are associated to the 2p half term, and these eight states are associated to the 2d3 half term. Now, these guys um, are generally written in such a way, uh, 2s plus 1, l, and j, where s is the spin, l is the angular momentum, and j is something more complicated, which is not important for our discussion. So in this case, the electron has a spin of half, and it's a bit 171 has one valence electron. So because s is half, 2, plus, 2 times half is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, so you have all the 2s appearing here. L, the orbital, orbital momentum here is exactly what you learn in chemistry, is the SPDF shells, which is why you see the SPND here. 
And J here is a combination of L and S, but um, it's not important. So as I mentioned, so we are not going to be discussing. The third part of the level diagram that's important are transitions. So any line that is drawn in this diagram uh, between atomic states, between these horizontal lines, are tran possible transitions. Now, all these transitions are fundamentally the same. They, I can, uh, the electron can go from one level to another level by absorbing a photon. It can also go from one level, uh, from a higher energy level to a lower level by emitting a photon. But in experiments, we typically uh, separate them into two categories. Uh, sorry, so the, these are examples. So from this state here to this state here is a 369 nanometer transition. From this state down here to the state up here is a 356 nanometer transition. The transitions um, are the same, but they are typically distinguished. So first is a driven transition. So driven transitions refer to the ones that we introduce a laser to to excite the, excite, uh, excite the electron from a lower energy state to a higher energy state. So for example, there will be this 369 nanometer laser here. Well, there are other transitions which are decays. Basically, the electron just happens to end up in this high energy position, and it will naturally decay down and emit a 356 nanometer photon along the way. But we don't actively drive this transition to promote an electron in this state to go to this state by introducing a 356 nanometer laser. OK, so all these states, what are they for? Um, the simplest way to understand what these states are for um, is by actually going back to quantum computation because it's the simplest example that I can think of. So these are all exact replicas of what uh, the level diagram that I've shown you just now of ethereum 171. I've just drawn them bigger. So for the 2s half, uh, which is to the bottom left of the uh, level diagram, you might have noticed the 0 and the 1 states. These are the qubit states in ethereum 171. And they are separated by a frequency of 12.6 gigahertz, which, in the, which is in the microwave region. So in experiments, what we actually can do is when we have a trapped ethereum 171 ion, we can just shoot what, uh, these microwaves at it. And we do shoot these microwaves at it. And it will flip the qubit from a 0 to a 1 state. That's all we have. But this is not enough for quantum computing. Because what do you want? We, first of all, we need Doppler cooling to cool the uh, atoms down. We need optical pumping, which is a process uh, that is used to make sure that we start every single quantum computing sequence in the zero state. And we need state detection. We need to be able to tell whether the qubit is in the zero or one state. So for this three purposes, um, we need other levels as well. And, the, and in the case of Ethereum, we, we, one extra level actually do, does all these things, is uh, using a 369 nanometer transition. So specifically, if you look at the state detection, what happens is that if you are in the one state, if the electron is in the one state or the qubit is in the one state, it will absorb the 369 nanometer photon from the laser and it will get excited to this level. Now, this excited state is not stable, so it will eventually decay back down to the state. And in this process, it will emit a 369 nanometer light. So the ion will look bright. It will shine in the camera. But if you are in the zero state, this 369 nanometer transition cannot happen because of this frequency difference between the one and the zero term. So at the end of your gate sequence, if you are in the zero qubit state, you will remain as a dark ion. If you are in the one qubit state, you have your light up. And that's how you tell whether a qubit is in the zero or one state in atomic uh, quantum computing. So at this point, you might wonder what are all the other states for? And just to blow up the diagram a bit, the other states are basically possible complications that can occur while you're doing quantum computing. So for example, consider this line here. This is a possible transition from this state to this state. Now, as I, uh, from the previous slide, you should know that this state, this transition over here, the 369 nanometer transition is necessary for state detection. We need it to tell whether the qubit is in the zero or one state. But what happens 0.5% of the time is that an electron that's been excited to this state, instead of going back down and making the, uh, the ion uh, fluoresce and bright, uh, shoot, shoot light out, the electron will instead decay to this state. And uh, because of background collisions with background gas, sometimes the electron can end up in this state as well. Now, the issue with these two states is that the lifetime or the average time it takes for the electron to go back down to a lower energy state. For this case, it's 52.7 milliseconds. And for this guy, it's 5.4 years, which means that if the electrons get stuck here, it will literally stay there for 5.4 years. And you can't use that for, as a quantum computer. It's literally useless for 5.4 years. 
And of course, you don't want that to happen. And this 52.7 milliseconds is a problem as well because the normal gate time, as you see in trapped ion uh, quantum computers, are on the order of uh, microseconds to milliseconds. So 52.7 milliseconds is a very, very long time for an ion to be stuck. So these other states are here because we need to introduce what's known as V pump releases. We want to pump these electrons out of these undesired states to uh, and push them back into this left uh, part of the level diagram where the qubit states are. And in ethereum, this, uh, this, this is done by a 935 nanometer laser over here, which is in the IR. Uh, yeah, in your IR and a red laser at 638 nanometers. So this ensures that our electrons won't be stuck here for 5.4 years and 52.7 milliseconds and not allow us to do computation. Okay, finally, uh, we can move to actually driving transitions. So we have the qubit state zero and one separated by omega naught. And if you uh, shine light on it uh, at the frequency of omega naught, and in the case of ethereum, as I mentioned, this is a microwave, the probability of you exciting an electron in the zero state to the one state is given by a disturb. It's a sine squared graph with omega, which is the rabbi frequency that uh, Jerry mentioned just now. It's basically a measure of how strong the coupling between these two states are. And T is your laser atom interaction time. So basically, how long is the laser on the atom for? And you can draw a graph of this with respect to time. And this is an actual experimental run. And this is on the order of milliseconds, and this is the excited state probability, the probability to be in state one. And we can see the rabbi flopping that is actually observed in our quantum computing systems. So what can you do with this? So for a single trapped ion, you can do simple one qubit gates. So for example, if you want to, as Jerry mentioned, if you want to flip the, the zero state to a one state, you need to apply what's known as a pi pulse and which corresponds to about this amount of time where the population is maximized. And if you want to do a superposition of your zero and one state, you want this probability to be exactly 0 0.5. And the time that is required to do that is known as a T pi over two or pi over two pulse. And in, uh, you can solve for this equation for when sine squared equals to one and when sine squared equals to half over here. And when it's equals to a one is basically a not gate in your, uh, in computing terms, and uh, this is done by a pi time of pi over omega over here. And when your population is half and half, so when you have a superposition of your ground state and excited state, you have a head of a gate, uh, which is another one qubit operation where your pi over two pulse is now pi over two sigma. So how do we actually do this in experiments? We, legit, uh, we legitimately just turn on and off the laser for this amount of time. That's what we do. Uh, and this, as you can see, is on the microseconds, and which is why the 52.7 millisecond uh, decay time for one of the uh, off resonance states is a problem. Okay, so I'll just briefly mention how entangling operations work in uh, such trapped, uh, trapped ion or trapped atom systems. For ions, we do entanglement via a motional move. So, what I mean by motional move? So if you have two ions in a trap, because of electrostatic repulsion, they repel each other, okay? And when you have two things that are repelling each other, they basically act as a spring. So what happens is that these ions in a trap can move either by the center of mass wave, so it, the entire thing can move left and right, or in the stretch wave, so the entire thing just pulls in and out. And what happens, um, what just happens to happen is that this motion in and out motion is actually correlated to the state of the atom. So if one of them is, uh, if you observe that the two of them are moving in this kind of a direction and you measure that one of them is in the zero state, the other will be definitely be in the one state, so on and so forth. This is not exactly how it works, but that's how we entangle uh, qubits in the ion system. Uh, in the superconducting system, the idea is the same. Um, I won't go through this in detail, but basically they have a cavity the cavity basically has the same dynamics as the motional modes. So you can use the cavity to chain, um, to entangle things together. And some of you might have heard of Rydberg states, Rydberg atoms. In this case, two atoms that are next to each other care about each other's state. So if it's one, if one, is guy, one guy is in the excited state, the other guy cannot be in the excited state, and so on and so forth. So this atom-atom interactions can be used to perform entangling operations. So that's about it. 
So this presentation, for my part at least, we talked about traps, the ion trap, uh, as well as the mod, and the atoms uh, specifically this, uh, showing you what the level diagrams are about, as well as uh, describing some simple transitions and simple one qubit quantum gates that you can perform in an actual experimental platform. So thank you, and yeah, any questions?